Can you see my screen? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, great. And I, I will turn on my webcam. I, I uh, got out of my PJs today, so I'm not afraid to turn on the webcam. Um, all right, everybody see my screen okay? It looks good? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, thanks, Liz. Well, welcome, everybody, to the Pragmatic Works training on the T's. Um, it's really a great opportunity for me to come and speak to you guys, and it's kind of a last-second thing. Um, so, um, Pragmatic Works kind of put me on the spot, but that's okay. Um, this is a session I've done before, and it's a really good session, um, which is why I don't mind doing it again. Um, Devin Knight and I delivered a session very similar to this uh, during Past Summit last year. Um, it was called multidimensional versus tabular, and so this is kind of the tabular side of things. And uh, the results we saw from the poll a few minutes ago is very typical to what we're seeing with our clients, um, even though the tabular uh, technology, and really Power Pivot has been out longer than that, but uh, even though the tabular model technology was released in uh, 2012, still not a lot of people are using those. And um, I think part of that um, is because of you know just the lack of knowledge around the technology, what it can do, how does it stack up against multidimensional is your organization right for tabular? So there's a lot of questions that come up when we start, uh, you know, trying to discuss, um, you know, is tabular the right decision for our organization, and is it the right decision for the business model? And for you to be able to make that decision, we have to know some things about uh, tabular models and how they work, how they're developed, what are the pros and cons there. Um, Tabular isn't really a silver bullet. It's not going to solve all your problems, but it can solve uh, some of them. And so we just need to understand how the technology works so that way we can make a good decision about whether tabular is right for us. And so based on the poll results, it looks like a lot of people aren't really sure if tabular is the right decision. Um, so some of you do have tabular models in production. Um, some of you are working on them, and we'll hope to have them in production soon at some point, I guess. And then it looks like a lot of you um, do not have um, tabular on the horizon. Um, so uh, that's what this session is all about. It's called a, kind of what the tabular, kind of a funny play on the session topic there. But uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Dustin Ryan and I am a senior BI consultant and trainer at Pragmatic Works. So I've been consulting um, for Pragmatic Works um, in the BI field for six years now. Um, so it's been a, it's a, Pragmatic Works a great company to work for. It's been an incredible experience. Um, love working for PW. Um, and also, I'm a trainer for Pragmatic Works, so I teach the Analysis Services Master's class, which is uh, primarily multidimensional focused. Um, so we took an in-depth look at some of the advanced techniques for designing OLAP cubes. Uh, so if you're interested in um, up in your multidimensional development game, um, definitely check out that class. And I also teach the Introduction to MDX. So MDX is one of those query languages that seems a little mysterious and complex, but we kind of break it down, make it a little simple for you. Um, so check out that class as well. Um, my primary focus is in data warehouse design and analysis services. So that's probably what I spend about 90% of my time doing. Used to do a lot of SSRS, don't spend that much time doing that anymore. Um, and then I also occasionally get my hands dirty with SSIS and SharePoint BI. Um, I've been a technical editor um, for Rocks Press before, a contributor, so if you've read the um, SQL Server Analysis Services 2012 Professional Edition, um, I was a contributor on that book and, and did a lot of uh, um, work on the chapter on MDX. Um, if you've if you were at Pass Summit last year, you may have seen me speaking there on the session uh, Tabular versus Multidimensional. I spoke at SQL Rally in Dallas last year as well. Um, I speak at SQL Saturday events regularly in Code Camp, so um, you may have seen me there. Um, and my hobbies are spending time with my family, um, sleep, very important, and then preparing for the war against the machines. It's coming, folks. Um, whether you realize it or not, you need to be prepared. So. A little joke there, but seriously, it's coming. Okay, so today, what we're going to talk about is making the right choice. So how do we decide uh, if the current project or the requirements dictated by the user um, lend themselves towards tabular or multidimensional? So we're going to look at the differences between tabular and multidimensional. And there's a lot of differences, so we're not going to hit all of them. But we're going to hit the high points. We're going to discuss some of the big ones that are going to kind of help you make that decision. So we may not hit all the, the little nitty-gritty details, um, but we're going to look at um, how the two technologies differ and 
and how the requirements may lend the, lend the project to go more the tabular route or the multidimensional route. Um, I'm going to try and go really fast through that. I'm going to try not to spend too much time on that. Um, I'd like to really, I'd like to get into building a tabular model so that way I can show you the basics of it because it looks like there's a lot of people in the class who have not maybe built a tabular model. Um, and so I'd like to get into the basics of that and show you just how really easy it is. Um, and then a as we go through building that, um, I'll, I'll, I'll point out and make a special emphasis on the best practices. Um, so that way I don't just leave you with kind of the basics of how to build a tabular model, but I kind of give you the best practices too. And then at the end I'll give you some resources. Um, so uh, let's jump into the showdown there. Um, two technologies enter, one technology leaves, right? Or, um, you know, kind of a play on Mad Max, Beyond Thunderdome there, good movies. Um, so we're going to discuss cubes versus the tabular models. and. Um, I'll post this, uh, the PowerPoint slide deck up on my blog, and at the end of the class, I'll, I'll post a link up to the, where my blog is at so you guys can keep an eye on that. Um, so don't worry about trying to copy all of this down. Um, the, the two uh, columns here that I want you to focus are, on are the multidimensional and the tabular. Um, power pivot, not so much. We're not going to spend any time talking about that, but I, I did put it in the slide so that way you guys have it as for informational purposes. Uh, so when we're talking about uh, multidimensional and we're talking about actions, uh, multidimensional natively supports actions, tabular does not. So if you have the requirement to drill through to an SSRS report, report for instance, um, that may kind of push you towards the multidimensional side. Now it's not natively built into tabular, but there is a plugin. Uh, you guys may have heard of a bids helper that does allow you to um, and it's a free install. The Bits Helper tool is a free install, and that does allow you to build in the actions into the tabular models. Um, but natively, multidimensional is the only technology that supports the, the drill through actions, which allow you to have a user click on a spreadsheet or a pivot table that they've opened up against analysis services and then jump to an SSRS report or an internet link or something like that. Um, based on the way multidimensional and tabular uh, work, Multidimensional is the only technology that supports aggregations, um, and, and we'll kind of get into the, the way um, Tabular organizes the data a little bit. Um, calculated measures, of course, supported in both technologies. Now, the, the query language is going to be different. If you've ever built a multidimensional cube, you know that calculations built in a multidimensional cube are going to be written in MD, MDX. And if you've ever built a tabular model, you know that the calculations built into a tabular model are going to be written using DAX, um, which is a really simple expression language. It's kind of um, very Excel-esque. Um, and the IntelliSense in the tabular designer is really good, so the calculations will almost write themselves for you. Um, if you have a requirement for custom roll-ups, so for instance, if you are reporting on some financial data or you're trying to build a report that displays a chart of accounts uh, for maybe balance sheets and income statements and that type of, th that type of reporting requirements, uh, custom roll-ups are supported with multidimensional that uh, can be tricky to do with tabular. So there's some workarounds there, but um, multidimensional supports that um, a lot more cleanly and easily. Um, both technologies support distinct count measures. Um, drill through, uh, or drill down rather, um, you do have that ability there. Hierarchies. Hierarchies are supported in both technologies and they're really, really easy to create in tabular models, um, which is very nice and multidimensional. There's a little bit more effort that goes into it um, and if you want a performance tune them, there's some even more effort that goes into it. Uh, but they are supported in both technologies. I'll jump down here. Parent-child hierarchies, very easily supported with multidimensional. Um, if you have the self-referencing relationship built into your data warehouse design or the table that you're using to build your um, multi or your parent-child dimension, um, it, will cre it will even create the parent-child hierarchy for you. It will automatically do it. Um, in tabular, parent-child hierarchies are not supported like they are in multidimensional, but you can uh, create the parent-child hierarchies basically by um, uh, building some DAX expressions that will kind of flatten out the parent-child hierarchy or naturalize it into your um, table and your tabular model. Uh, this is an important one here. Many-to-many -many relationships very easily 
natively supported in multidimensional, not so much in tabular. You're going to have to write some DAX to get that to work there. Uh, KPIs, both supported in multidimensional and tabular. Um, very, also very easy to create in tabular. Um, partitioning, supported in both technologies, although it works a little bit differently in uh, multidimensional versus tabular. In multidimensional, you can only partition your measure groups. In tabular, you can partition your uh, fact tables or your dimension tables in the tabular model. Um, and so partitioning in that sense does give you a little bit uh, more flexibility with your tabular model and it allows you to do some neat things with processing whereas uh, you don't have to process an entire dimension table you can process um, only a partition of a dimension table um, also with that said the partitioning um, works a little bit differently between the technologies um, in multi-dimensional cubes you partition to improve processing performance uh, because partitions are processed in parallel in your multi-dimensional cube and you partition to improve your query performance so that way when a user writes a query and says I only want to see data for 2006 uh, their query will only go against the 2006 partition rather than crawling all of the other partitions um, and so partitioning multidimensional improves processing performance and query performance uh, with tabular processing doesn't help your process or partitioning does not help your processing performance because in tabular the partitions are processed serially so even if you partition your data and break it up by year um, not going to help your processing per, or your processing time performance um, but the partitioning uh, is solely used to improve um, the administration of your cube so that way you can improve your processing time by only having to process partitions that contain your change data um, so you're not going to partition your tabular model to improve your um, the performance of processing itself, but you may you may partition your tables in tabular to kind of make it easier to manage which partitions you process, which data needs to be read into your tabular model. Uh, Semi-additive measures, perspectives, uh, all supported in in both technologies. Translation translations not supported uh, natively in tabular models. Um, and write back not supported in tabular models and basically what write back does if you're unfamiliar is it allows you to write data into your cube um, so not natively supported with a tabular model um, so there is that all right so moving on all right so there are several considerations that we have to take when deciding um, whether we want to go with a tabular model or a multi-dimensional cube we have scalability performance, time to develop, complex business problems, and learning curve. And these five points here are all based off kind of the list that we just discussed. And so I'm just going to kind of rip through these really quick so that way we can get into the part where we do the fun stuff and, and design the tabular model. So I may not mention every item on this, um, but like I said, I will put the uh, PowerPoint up on my blog so that way you guys can download it. So when we're talking about scalability, um, kind of the big difference right between tabular and multidimensional is that tabular has the ability to store all of your data in memory um, which is very cool because your queries come back super super fast and so that that is a big reason why a lot of people decide to go with tabular is because they, they decide you know what we need really blazing consistently fast query performance and so we're gonna go with tabular so I imagine that many of you in here who are developing tabular models may have gone that route because of the really great query performance and that's because the data is stored in memory. Uh, Multidimensional, not stored in memory, it's going to um, be pre-aggregated on disk. Uh, so what that means about the tabular technology is that the amount of data that you have is going to play um, into the, your decision making process about whether we should go with tabular or multidimensional. So if you've got 10 terabytes worth of data, you're not going to go with tabular probably. You're going to have to go with multidimensional um, because you're not going to be able to store you know, 10 terabytes worth of data in memory. Now if you have 20 gig worth of data, maybe you are going to go with tabular. Maybe that is something you're going to go with. Now, and probably most of you don't have cubes that are 20 gig. Um, very rarely do you see people with um, cubes that big, although many of our clients do have cubes that large, but just the, the average um, person or the average organization using um, analysis services does not have you know 20 gig cubes. Um, so um, the amount of data that you have is going to 
play into your decision making process on whether we're going to go with tabular or multidimensional. Um, one thing I will say is that if you have 20 gig of data, or actually let's make this easier on me uh, math wise, let's say if you've got 10 gig worth of data and so you need to you need to store 10 gig worth of data in memory in tabular, many people will say okay well if I have got 10 gig worth of data I'm going to need at least 10 gig worth of memory on my server available to store that in memory. And that's not true. Um, if you have 10 gig worth of data, um, not taking into account the data compression, um, you're going to need about 25 gig worth of available memory on the server. And the reason for that is you need to store, you need to be able to store two copies of the tabular model in memory. Um, so if you're doing a process full, uh, while it's processing that, it needs to be able to store uh, an additional copy of that tabular model in, in memory. So if you've, if you've got 10 gig worth of data, 10 gig tabular model, you really need about 25 gig available. Uh, 20 to store two copies of the data model, and then five for various overhead uh, processes for the operating system and whatever else you might have running on the server. So that's something to keep in mind. If you've got 10 gig tabular model, you're probably going to need about 25. Um, so something there to keep in mind. Um, performance, generally speaking, I already mentioned this, tabular is going to outperform uh, multidimensional, um, not in every case, but in most cases. And it really depends on the type of reporting that you're going to be doing. Um, if you are building an analysis services um, solution that is designed to support a series of executive level dashboards, um, it's a very high level uh, granularity wise of reporting. Uh, you could probably go with tabular or multidimensional and get really great query performance. In the demo that we did at Pass, uh, we demonstrated two styles of reports. We built one against, we built, well, actually it was four reports, uh, one against multidimensional and one against tabular at a very high level um, as if it were an executive level dashboard. And the query performance between both uh, reports very, very similar. Um, and, and even the multidimensional was slightly faster. Um, we built two more reports, one against tabular and one against multidimensional, that were at a very low level report, at a very, at a, like a sales order item report, down to the very bottom grain. And tabular was very, very fast. It continued to be very, very fast. Multidimensional, not so much. The report took over a minute to come back. Um, and so you have to understand what type of reporting you're going to be doing. If there's a requirement for Low level, low level reporting, extremely granular reporting across the board. You know you're going to have many reports that may kind of push you towards the tabular side. Uh, if you're going multidimensional and you have the requirement for low level reports, you may have to kind of get clever with how you're going to deliver that information. Uh, are you going to build drill through reports to uh, display the data uh, straight from the data warehouse? Maybe you're going to design an SSRS report that's going to read right from the data warehouse so that way you're not trying to display that data from the multidimensional cube. So um, the performance there is going to be different, and for you to be able to make that decision on which technology will be uh, the best, you kind of know have to know what are the reporting requirements for the solution. Is it going to be supporting a bunch of dashboards, or is it going to be supporting um, some low-level reports, or is it going to be supporting, uh, you don't know what, right? We don't know. The, the users are going to connect with pivot tables and tear it apart, and we really have no way to predict how they're going to use the data. Um, so you kind of need to know what the reports, what the reporting uh, use is going to be for you to decide which technology is going to be the best. Uh, time to develop. Uh, this is a big difference between the two technologies. Uh, so if you've ever developed a multidimensional cube, you know that you're going to have to spend a little bit more than a weekend doing it. Um, if for you to have a multidimensional cube that is ready to go to production, it's probably going to take you um, a month or more, um, depending on the complexity of it. Now, if you if you work agile and you may you may have something ready to go. If you're an experienced cube designer, you may have something ready for a QA type testing um, in a few weeks. Um, if uh, if not, it's probably going to take you longer. Tabular takes far less time to develop. Um, so if you if uh, what I'll say about the time to develop here is that. If you can't make up your mind, if you're not sure whether you should go with multidimensional or tabular, you just can't make up your mind, I would say start with tabular uh, because tabular takes far less time to develop. It's really easy to develop. It's so simple, and you'll see that as we, as we kind of work on that, that it, you'll be able to get very, very far with your tabular model development in a very short amount of time. 
Um, whereas if you start with multidimensional first, um, it may, you may be weeks into the development of the cube before you realize, ooh, we should have gone with tabular. Whereas if you start with tabular, you may only be a day in before you realize, oh, we need to go with multidimensional. And so that's why I, I tell people, start with tabular. If you, if you just can't make up your mind, you're not sure which one you should go with, start with tabular, see what you can get done, see how long it'll, see how far you can get, and if you run into any roadblocks or, or stumble a little bit, um, then, uh, then you can always go back to multidimensional, and you're only, you know, a couple days in the hole. Whereas if you start multidimensional first, you may get a couple months in the hole, and then realize, ooh, we should go on tabular, and, and that's not as, as desirable. Uh, complex business problems. We already mentioned this. Tabula tabular can handle things like role-playing dimensions, parent-child hierarchies, many-to-many -many relationships, um, but it's going to require DAX calculations and a little bit of um, cleverness to kind of work around those things. Multidimensional very easily and natively supports things like role-playing dimensions, parent-child hierarchies, many-to-many -many relationships. Um, so multidimensional has the ability to um, work with those complex um, relationships. Um, one thing that multidimensional that is not listed here, that, but one thing that multidimensional supports that tabular is not is ragged hierarchies. So if you have uh, ragged type hierarchies in um, in your business, and you need to build that into your um, solution. Multidimensional uh, easily supports that um, using hide member if the hide member if property. And those of you who are familiar with analysis or may be familiar with that. No such thing exists in tabular. Um, so something else to keep in mind there. Learning curve. Uh, ooh, one thing that just popped in my mind. Let me step back a couple here. I, I definitely want to mention this. Um, time to develop. Um, forgot to point this out here, and I want to make sure I hit it. Tabular models can be created by upgrading a Power Pivot workbook. So if you've got this really great Power Pivot workbook, and you just kind of want to take it to the next level, um, you can upgrade your Power Pivot workbook to Tabular, which will allow you to add things like security, role-based security, partitioning, um, perspective. So you have that ability to take a, a, a Power Pivot workbook and just upgrade the tabular and start adding in the kind of the enterprise features like the security and partitioning and whatever. Um, so that can greatly decrease your time to develop if you already have a power pivot workbook which does mostly um, what you are required um, to, to give the users. So I want to point that one out. Um, all right, learning curve. Learning curve um, can be steep for multidimensional, especially if you have a a uh, requirement for complex calculations, MDX. If you've ever tried to learn MDX on your own, you've probably run into uh, some learning difficulties there because it can be pretty challenging. Um, DAX, a lot easier to learn. So if you can write Excel formulas, then you can probably figure out your way around DAX. Uh, KPI creation in tabular, super easy, just drag and drop. Um, if you can follow a wizard, you can probably build some KPIs. And the relationships are between the objects and tabular model will be super simple too. Um, Pretty much everything with multidimensional is going to be um, a lot more difficult. Take you take you more time, um, but there's some. But it, but the more time you spend on multidimensional, you can uh, get it to perform uh, really well and, and accomplish your uh, business requirements. Um, KPI creations is going to require you to know MDX, so it's a lot more complex there. You have the multiple relationship types. Um, you have reference relationships, regular relationships, fact relationships, many-to-many -many relationships, data mining relationships. So a lot of, mul lot of relationship types in multidimensional cubes, whereas in tabular, you don't really have that concept. All right. One thing to keep in mind here is if once you start down the path, there's no migration to the other technology. It's not like you can start developing a tabular model and decide, wow, we should really should have gone multidimensional. I'm just going to convert this to a multidimensional cube. You, know, you don't have that ability, unfortunately. Um, another uh, consideration there is tabular is going to be best on its own machine, um, and that has to do with the nature of, of storing the data in memory. Um, so not a great candidate for shared service. Um, a lot of people will run analysis services multidimensional side by side with SQL Server. They'll have their data warehouse on in their SQL Server um, on the one machine, and then they'll also have uh, the multidimensional analysis services running side by side with it. Um, so I won't go through all this. Kind of hit all this um, uh, through the slides, and I'll let you guys spend some time um, digging through this. If you if you prefer, you can download the slide deck from my blog. All right, so let us take a look at building the tabular model. All right. 
All right, so I've got my remote desktop here to my virtual machine. Sorry, my mouth is getting dry here. Okay, so all of our tabular model development is going to take place here in uh, Visual Studio. So if you've got the SQL Server Data Tools plugin installed, um, that's where you're going to do the development. And you're just going to create it just like you will any other analysis services project. You're just going to go up to File, select New Project. And then I'm going to select analysis services over here. And let me do one other thing. Let me turn on my zoom it so that way I can highlight things and point things out to you. All right. So you'll notice here we've got a lot of options here. We've got the analysis services options here for the multidimensional cubes. Then you've got the tabular options. You can create a tabular uh, model in a brand new project right there. You can import one off the server, so if you hired this really great consulting firm and then they turn out to not be so great because you should have gone with Pragmatic Works, then you can, uh, and, they, and, and this other consulting firm built you the tabular model and deployed it, but then took all the files and ran, you can import the tabular model uh, from the server if it's out there on the server. And then there's the option that I was telling, about, telling you about earlier. You can import your tabular model from a Power Pivot uh, workbook. So if you've got a Power Pivot workbook that you want to upgrade straight to tabular, you can do that here. Uh, for this example, I'm going to select this option here, Analysis Services Tabular Project. And we'll just call this, um, we'll call this Tuesday Training 2014-0909. All right, and I'm going to click OK. All right, you'll see it's creating the project here. And we've got this little screen here that pops up, and it's asking for us to specify a, work, a workspace server. What this is here is that for you to be able to develop a tabular model, you actually need to be able to connect to a running instance of analysis services in tabular mode. Um, so if you, if you have not installed analysis services in tabular mode, you will not have a workspace server. Um, and so if you currently have a analysis services running and you have multidimensional cubes like that, out there, that's not going to work for you. You're going to have to install another instance of analysis services uh, in tabular mode. And so that's where we're going to specify this. If you are unsure of whether you have analysis services installed in tabular, come on now. No, for some reason it won't let me display my explorer. There we go. That's what I was looking for, object explorer. If you're unsure of whether you have analysis services running in tabular or not, just connect to Analysis Services in Management Studio. And look at the icon here. This is the tabular instance, which has the little blue table looking thing. And this is the multidimensional instance, which has the picture of the cube. So I have the two instances installed here. One is the default instance, one is the named instance. So if you want to run multidimensional cubes and tabular cubes side by side, you're going to need um, two instances of Analysis Services to do that. All right back to data tools. So I'm going to specify my workspace server here. So for me to even be able to develop a tabular model, you need to be able to connect to a running instance of analysis services um, in tabular mode. And so that's what I specified here. I'm going to test my connection. All right, well, we have succeeded, so that looks good. Compatibility level looks fine there, so I'm going to click OK. All right. So what we have here is we have our model, and we have our project here, our tabular project. So if I go back to Management Studio, and I'm going to disconnect from my multidimensional instance here, and I'm going to refresh this, what you will see here is a database, an analysis services database, Tuesday Training 2014-0909. This is actually our workspace um, tabular model that has actually been deployed to the cube. So as we make changes in data tools, those changes will get pushed out to this um, to this model that's actually on the server. Um, now, in, in the settings here, you can specify whether this model will stay in memory after you disconnect from data tools. Um, but as long as we're developing, um, this model will be out here on the server. And then when I close up data tools and I'm done developing, it will be unloaded from the server. Um, unless we deploy to the server, at that point, the, our model will be on the server and as a deployed analysis services database. So once I deploy this out to the server, I'll actually have two models out there on the server, my deployed model and then the workspace model, which will stay in memory as long as I keep developing in data tools. And so we'll, we'll kind of see that. 
Let me close this up. All right. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're actually going to need to connect to a data source. Um, and and if, if you guys are like me, the first time you created a, a blank tabular model, you were like, okay, what do I do next? I, it's, I got a blank screen here. Am I waiting for something to load? I don't know. Uh, so the first thing that you're going to need to do is create a, um, a data connection. To do that, I'm going to go up to the model, up at the model option up at the top. We're going to go to import from data source. All right. And so this is definitely one of the strengths of Tabular. This is going to be one of the things that you're going to want to take into consideration when you're trying to decide, do I go with Tabular? Do I go with multidimensional? I don't know. You want to think about where your data is at. So Tabular, just like multidimensional, is going to work really well if you have a star schema type data warehouse. Um, and, and it really is the, the best practice to build your Tabular models and multidimensional cubes on top of a star schema data warehouse. But if you don't, if you really want to just throw something together quickly because you've got some data out here in SQL Server and then maybe you've got some stuff in um, Oracle and then you've got some stuff in the spreadsheet over here and then maybe you've got some stuff in Access, um, you can connect to all of those with Tabular. Multidimensional isn't going to be able to connect to a lot of those different types of data sources. Um, if you've got data in Excel, flat files, SSRS reports, multidimensional can't get to those. Uh, tabular can. So if you just scroll through this list, you see all the different types of data sources that you have the ability to connect to with a tabular model. Text files, Excel files, RSS feeds, SSRS reports, even analysis services cubes, um, Sybase, Teradata, Oracle. Uh, for this example, we're just going to wire up to SQL Server. So I'm going to select that here and click Next. All right, let's specify our server name. In this case, it's just localhost and the database name. All right, so we've got a bunch of junk out here, so I'm just going to connect up to AdventureWorks DW. Let's test the connection. All right, that looks good. All right, here's our impersonation information. Um, this is going to be the account that Analysis Services is going to use to access the data source when you're not there. So if you're scheduling processing of your tabular model during the night when everybody's at home asleep, um, this is going to be the account that Analysis Services is going to use to get to the data source. So if you have a specific account that you want to use for processing, uh, you, can use, you can enter that in here. Uh, you may have set up your service account. So this is the Analysis Services service account. You can specify to use the SSAS service account to access that data source. Um, that's an option as well. So my service account does have access to the AdventureWorks data warehouse, so I'm going to select that here. All right, this is where we're going to specify which data from AdventureWorks DW do we want to suck into our data or our, our tabular model. Uh, so if, you've, if you have a, a query that you've written that, you, that has the data uh, that you want to put into the tabular model, maybe you've written a query that does a little bit of transformation on the data and does some cleaning up of the data and things like that, you can select this option here and, and paste the query into the query window. Um, if you just want to suck in the data from certain tables and views, you can do that here. Um, this is the option I'm going to select because I want to specify which tables I want to bring into the tabular model. All right. So you've got a list of the tables and views here. One of the, one of the neat things here is you can come down here and find your fact table. So if I know that I want to bring in my, let's say, reseller sales and I'm going to put a checkbox next here to the fact reseller sales. I'm going to select this option here to select related tables. And what the wizard here will do is it will look at the referential integrity in your database. It will look at the foreign key relationships between the fact table and the dimensions. And based on those foreign key relationships, it will select the other tables for you. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, and you can see here that it's selected a bunch of other stuff here. If you accidentally click, uh, click this button here and you didn't mean to, and the wizard selects 50 other tables, um, there's no real easy way to say, oops, undo that. You're going to have to come in here and deselect everything and then kind of start over. So just be aware of that. So in this case, I'm going to click factory seller sales. I'm going to select select related tables. And there's some things in here that I'm going to deselect because I don't want to bring in everything. So sales territory, yes. Reseller, yes. Promotion, we can do that one. Product, employee, date, that looks good. I don't really care about the currency, so I'm going to get rid of that one here. And this is where I'm going to point you, um, point out to you the best, or the first best practice here. 
as you're uh, bringing in these, these tables into your tabular model, um, give them good names here. Give them user-friendly names here. You want to you name these tables uh, something that is going to be um, easily understood by your users. Your users may not understand what a fact is or what a DIM is. They may, uh, they may ask you questions like, well, why does it say DIM sales territory instead of sales territory? Um, they just don't understand dimensional modeling or they, don't, they haven't been educated on it. So what I would do is I would come in here and I would name all of these something that is user-friendly. And the reason for that is the most important thing when developing uh, your analysis services solution is that you design a solution that is um, easily understood by your users because that's your users are going to dictate whether your solution is a success. So if you develop this great solution, it does all this really cool stuff, but your users don't like to use it for whatever reason. Maybe they don't understand what the tables mean or the dimensions mean or what the columns do because the naming is really bad or it performs really slowly. For whatever reason, if your users don't use your solution, then your project is a failure. So you want to go out of your way to make everything in your solution as user-friendly as possible. And so that even includes doing some simple little things like naming your dimensions and measure groups, something that is very easily understood by your users. And so if you can take just a couple seconds to make sure everything is named correctly, even little things like using camel casing will just make your solution a little bit easier to use by your users. So you want to take those extra steps to make things um, easier to use uh, for your users. So always keep your users in mind. If you're, if you're thinking about making a change to your solution, think about how is this going to affect the users because if they don't like to use the solution, users are very clever. They'll think of other ways to do their normal day job and, and they'll get around having to use the cruddy tabular model that you've developed. So something always to keep in mind there. All right, so once we've um, specified the tables that we want to bring into our tabular model and we've given them good friendly names here that our users will like, uh, we can also filter um, out which columns and rows we want to bring into our um, tabular model. So let's go down here to Fact Reseller Sales. So I'm going to select this row here and I'm going to click this option to Preview and Filter. And so what this is going to do is kind of give you a preview of the data that's in the table and this is really cool. So if you've got this really big fact table that includes data for like the last 15 years but you know that your users only really need data from the last five you can come in here and you can specify a filter um, just like you might in Excel uh, for a certain date range so I can click on the date column here go to number filters I can go to between and I can say where the order date key is uh, between 2005, 0101, and um, you know, 2014, 1231, or something like that. And so, what will happen is that this data here will be filtered for us, and it will um, be put into the query. So that brings us to our second best practice item that you want to follow: only bring in data that is necessary for your tabular model. Remember, all of this is going to get loaded up into ta up into memory. So if you're bringing in a ton of data that you know your users aren't going to use. Um, that's going to take up resources on your server. So only bring in data that is absolutely required for the user. Um, so that includes rows. So you can apply the row filters here like I just showed you here. That also includes columns. So if you know that your users don't really care to report on things at the sales order number level, deselect these columns. Um, now in this case I'm going to leave that one in there, but things like the uh, promotion key, um, or um, actually currency key, right? We didn't bring in the currency dimension, so I don't need this column here in the fact table. Um, if I know that, come on, there it goes, locked up there for me a second. If I know that my reporting isn't going to use um, some of these measures like, uh, let's see, discount amount or unit price discount percent, I don't need to make measures off these columns, so I'm going to deselect those, and I'm going to click OK here. So you see there's some filters applied there. Um, same thing for product dimension. I would go through all of these tables and deselect the columns that I don't care to have in my tabular model. Um, so uh, our company only reports on, U or this tabular model is only for US, so we don't really need the Spanish translations for the product names, French, uh, whatever. I'm going to make sure that I go through and deselect every single column that is not absolutely required for your users. So uh, the one thing I'll say about 
um, discovering requirements for your users is that if you provide them a list of every column you have in your data warehouse and ask them to select which ones uh, they need, chances are they're going to select a, not, a lot more than what is absolutely necessary because in a user's mind, they're going to think, okay, well, I need this, and then I probably will need this column at some point in the future, so I want to make sure I get that one, and, oh, this is interesting, and so I'll get, select this one. And so they're going to go through, and they're going to select every single thing in the table. Um, if you go to them and ask them kind of from the standpoint, what do they need, and I want you to provide a list for me as the developer, chances are they'll approach it from the standpoint of, okay, let me think about how I approach my day job. What do I do day after day? Okay, let's see, on this day of the month I do my, my quarterly reporting, and so um, that report has these columns, and so I need these guys. And then every day I like to look at this report, and this one has this column. So chances are if you ask them to provide you a list on their own, they'll, they'll think about their day job, and they'll give you a, a very meaningful list of the things they need as opposed to you just giving them a list of everything you have in the data warehouse and say, okay, check off what you want. They're going to go through and check everything, and then you're going to end up with this you know, disgusting bloated tabular model that includes a lot more than what they actually need. Um, so second best practice there is only include things in the tabular model that you absolutely need, uh, including rows and columns. Now for this example, I'm not going to spend a lot of time you know, going through all of these tables and deselecting all the stuff like I would if I was building this for a client, but, but you guys get the point. All right, so I'm going to click Finish here. All right, and so what's happening now is that Analysis Services is actually querying those tables that we selected and is actually sucking down all the rows out of the table here. And the reason there's a delay there is because it's sucking down all this data, importing it into our tabular model, and it's actually making the changes out here on the workspace server as we're developing. Um, so it's kind of the, one of the annoying things about tabular models that every time you do a click, it has to make that change out on the on the analysis service server. Um, so there is a little bit of a delay sometimes when you do different things, um, but usually it's not significant. Usually it's just a few seconds whenever you you know rename a column or create a hierarchy or add a KPI or measure or you know whatever. Um, so there there usually is a little bit of a delay whenever you make a change. Okay, so we brought in our tables here. Um, you'll notice here that it kind of looks like Excel. Um, so it's kind of a, uh, for those of you who are not, you know, hardcore SSAS developers or maybe more of a power user, this is going to be a very familiar environment, especially if you have done power pivot development. If you've done power pivot development, you're going to be right at home with building tabular models. So if you know how to build power pivot workbooks, you know how to build tabular models. Uh, so you can see all of the tables that are brought into our tabular model here. They're all listed down here at the bottom, and I can flip through them just by clicking on the tabs here. We also have, um, so this is the grid view, we also have the kind of the model view, um, which displays all of our, our tables in, um, in a diagram. Um, so if you're kind of looking at, wanting to look at, you know, how do these tables relate to one another, you want to flip to your diagram view, which is that icon there. If you want to go back and look at the individual rows in the tables, you want to go back to your grid view here. So you got the diagram view, you got the grid view there. Right now, we are in our diagram view and we can see how the uh, tables relate to one another. Now, you may be asking yourself, self, what are these dotted lines? So we have the um, uh, multiple relationships here between the fact table and the date dimension, and that's because there are the multiple foreign keys created between reseller sales and the date dimension, but why are some of them dotted in uh, solid? Uh, the reason for that is Remember, we talked about tabular models do not support role-playing dimensions like you have in multidimensional. When you have a multiple relationships existing between a fact table and a dimension in multidimensional, analysis services will automatically create the multiple cube dimensions based on that one um, dimension. They're called role-playing dimensions. In, um, in tabular, you don't have that. So you can only have one active relationship here between the fact table and the date dimension. If I double-click on it, you'll see that this relationship here is flagged as active, and you can see the columns that are used to create that relationship, order date key, date key. So the active relationship between the fact table and the date dimension is based on that order date key. So I would probably, it would probably make sense on my part to go in here and rename this. So I'm just going to right click on this table, select rename, and I'm going to rename this order date. That's probably going to make more sense for my users. Now, these other relationships here, I'm just going to double-click on them and bring them up. 
you can see this is the relationship between the ship date key in the fact table and the date key in the date dimension. This one is flagged as not active. Not active. So the, the relationship exists, but when I slice my uh, fact measures here by, my, by the, the date dimension, it's going to use order date key as opposed to the ship date key or the due date key. So if I want my users to be able to slice by both order date and ship date, I'm going to need to actually import an additional copy of the date dimension. So I would come up here and go to model, go to, uh, let's see, existing connections. I'm going to open this connection here. I'm going to go through this little wizard again. I'm just going to bring in a copy of my date dimension again. We'll call this ship date. I'm going to click finish. It's going to actually import an additional copy of the date dimension. Let me close this. Notice the delay here. It's actually making the change out on the server, so that's why there's a little bit of a delay. There's my ship date table, and now I need to create the relationship. So I'm just going to click on my ship date key up here in the reseller sales measure group, or actually fact table, not a measure group here in tabular model, and I'm going to relate it here to the date key. So you always remember you want the arrow pointing at the table that has the primary key. In this case, the dimension has the primary key, so the arrow needs to be pointing at the primary key. And so now I have a ship date dimension and an order date dimension. So I'm going to go ahead and, and delete this relationship here, these unused relationships from the model, since, I'm, since I've created the role-playing dimension here. So that's kind of the workaround there for the role-playing dimensions. All right. Now, let's, uh, let's talk about creating hierarchies here. Let me uh, expand this a little bit, make this a little bit bigger so you can see it. Creating hierarchies in tabular model, super easy. If I want to create a, tab a, a hierarchy in the tabular model, I'm just going to right-click on the column that I want to add to the hierarchy and select Create Hierarchy. So a little bit of a delay there. You see how it's doing the um, work there, and I'm just going to call this my ship date calendar hierarchy. We'll call it that. Okay, hit enter. So I rename in the hierarchy. Calendar year is the first level. Let's say I want to add calendar semester. I'm just going to right click on calendar semester, go to add to hierarchy, and then I can select which hierarchy I want to add it to. So it's going to add it as the next level in the hierarchy. So it's very, very easy to create hierarchies in tabular. It's just a matter of uh, clicking and uh, knowing which hierarchy you want to put it in. So let's put month, number of year. Oops, minimized on me there. So that's how easy it is to create hierarchies in tabular. No setting up attribute relationships like you would in multidimensional cubes. Um, no, uh, you know, composite keys or anything like that. Uh, tabular model, very, very simple to create that, the user-defined hierarchies. Okay, if I want to rename any of these columns, I can just right-click on them and select uh, rename. So if I just want to call this one month, I can do that. Um, so renaming things, very simple. If you want to hide a column, maybe after I've added these columns to the hierarchy and I want to hide it, I can just uh, select it and right-click on it and select hide from client tools. And what you'll see is now that the object will, will kind of turn gray. Um, when it's grayed out like that, it means it's still a part of the tabular model. Um, it's just not uh, visible to the client tools. Excuse me. All right. So uh, moving on. Let's see what else do I want to cover here. Okay. So that's how we create the hierarchy. So we've looked at creating the role-playing dimensions. We looked at creating the hierarchies. Uh, let's go back to the grid view. And let's talk about creating some measures. So I'm going to go to the reseller table. or I'm sorry, actually reseller sales. This is where we have our measures. Creating measures, uh, very, very simple. So if I want to create a measure based on my sale amount here, I'm just going to select, I can select the column here and just click the little sigma icon here. Or I can click the arrow next to it and say, okay, I want to build a measure based off the sum or the average or the count or whatever. I'm going to click sum here and it's going to actually just create the calculation for me. So very simple formula here, sum sales amount. Looks very similar to Excel. If I want to create an additional column here that just counts the rows, I can do that. I can say count. So now I've got two measures here. 
sum of sales amount, count of sales amount. All right, if we want to do any kind of formatting here, you can right click on it. Um, let's see, actually, I want to pull up the properties here. Bring up your properties window, click on the measure. You can do the formatting here, so you can see that it automatically picked up that this should be format as a currency. Count of sales amount did not correctly pick that up, so I'm going to have to change this to format as a, um, I'm going to say whole number here. And you'll see that the formatting here on the measure will now change. So this one's currency, this one's just as a whole number. Okay, so looks good there. Um, it's always good to kind of interact with your tabular model during the development process as a as a user would, um, and you know most of your users will, um, will probably connect to your tabular model using Excel. Um, based on my experience with our clients, this is what we've seen: is that Excel is the tool of choice for interacting with tabular models. If you want to open up your tabular model from Excel, there's a little button up here at the top. Just click the little Excel icon, and that will actually open up Excel create a blank pivot table and establish the data connection to your workspace tabular model. So I'm going to click that Excel button there. You can specify if you want to browse as a particular user or a role, if you have a security role in your tabular uh, model that you want to use. I'm just going to browse as me. And so this is going to open up Excel, create the blank pivot table, create the data connection, and then, and then I can actually kind of play with the tabular model. So here we can see there's the measures we've created. And see how fast that is? If you blinked, you probably missed me clicking on it and it appearing here. And so I can even do some really low-level granular reporting. So for instance, let's see. Let me find uh, my reseller sales table. And so if I wanted to break this down by sales order number, boom, done. See how fast that was? Super, super fast. That's because it's stored all on memory, even on a, a puny little virtual machine like I have here with not a whole lot of memory running. It's still lightning fast. Um, so it goes down to a very low level. I can even break it out by sales order number and sales order line number. Um, so very, very cool. That one took a little bit of a uh, chugging there to break out the individual sales order numbers. But even then, it only took you know, five or six seconds to give you that super low level reporting. All right. So let's go back to data tools. OK. Um, so if you want to do things like add partitions, um, you can come up here and select this icon here. So partitions are going to be added by clicking on the little cube icon. It's got a, like a daddy cube and then a baby cube is what it looks like. I'm going to click that icon here. And this is where you can specify your partition. So by default, um, your table is loaded into a single partition. If I want to create a new partition, I can just click the little new button there. And there's no, uh, you know, where clause that you've got to write or do anything like that. I can just come in here and say, you know what, I want this partition to be order date between 2005-0101, 2005-1231. And I'm going to call this my 2005 partition, reseller sales 2005. I want to set one up for 2006. can do that here. So you can see creating partitions in tabular, super, super easy. It doesn't take much time at all. So this is my 2006 partition. It's just a matter of uh, adding the filters in here, just like you would if you were working in Excel. Um, then I could come back and, and delete this partition. Uh, you want to make sure that you do that, because otherwise I'm going to have duplicates for 2005 and 2006, because I've got a, a partition that is pulling data from 2005, and then I've got another partition from 2006, and then I've got a partition that has data for, um, you know, all time. Okay, let's see. All right, I'm going to click OK here. And so once I click OK here, it's going to, um, we're going to need to reprocess this table here. So I can go up to Model here. Let's see, process table, and I'm going to process reseller sales. So it just selected data for those two partitions. OK, so now I've got my rows back here. All right, come on, close for me. Sorry, take another second. Um, adding security roles into your tabular model is super easy as well. Just click the little roles icon up at the top, which is the little picture of the people there. Click New. I want to call this, um, let's see, product category, um, let's see, uh, we'll just call this bikes. Maybe we've, we, uh, we 
break our security out by um, uh, maybe by category so our sales teams can't see you know maybe we have a sales team for the bikes who sell only bikes and we have a sales team who sells only athletic apparel and so we want to break our security out by the product category um, so I'm going to call this one bikes permission we'll just give it read access and the DAX filter we're going to apply here is going to be um, I think it is called uh, is it called category equals bikes I think that's the syntax for that if there's a syntax error you'll get this little thing here so let's see I think it's uh, maybe it's the double quotes okay do I need the uh, single 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 equal sign I don't know what I'm missing there but yeah you guys get the point there um, as far as uh, you know what exactly the uh, the way this works and I think it's because I don't have the column name right so let's go back and see what we can get there for it what that let's see where is it oh you know what it is I didn't there isn't a category um, field on this table it's actually in a different category so um, if I want to do let's do let's do something like this sales territory region we'll do this break this out by company or country right sales territory country let's do that sales territory let's say uh, sales territory country equals um, United States I think that's what it is so let's see if it gives me an error. I always forget between all the different query languages that you're required to know to work in Microsoft BI I always forget is it single ticks or the double ticks I forget okay maybe it's the uh, single equal sign all right I think that's it there okay so let's hit okay and we can test this by clicking on our Excel button here at the top let's say you know what? let's browse this as our role let's see if this works there's our role we created I just left it the, the default name of role um, and so it's going to open up the connection here in Excel as if I were the um, part of that role and so let's add this in here there's a measure all right let's bring in our sales territory country just to make sure it's working correctly all right country rows all right US so we got security so this role can only see sales for the United States so pretty easy to set up very very cool super easy to set up just gotta write a simple little uh, row filter um, function there um, in the role manager and uh, very very easy if I want to create any new roles I can just click new and I can just add all the roles I want here so pretty easy if I want to add members here then I can come in here and add the specific Windows users you guys are probably familiar with this this dialog box there um, so this is where you add the members of the role if you want to add any uh, perspectives, let's see, I think this is the icon here. Yep, you can click this little icon here to add perspectives. Remember, perspectives are kind of like a view that you set up for your uh, cube or your tabular model. So you want to just kind of um, provide a correct perspective for your users. Maybe you have users who do reporting on only the products. And so we might call this our products perspectives. And so they don't really want to see tab uh, employees or or uh, promotions or anything like that they just really only care about what's in the product dimension and what's in the reseller sales so that's really all they care about so I would come in here and select those items so that way when a user connects to the cube and, and specifies they want to use the products perspective the only thing that they'll see in their list of pivot ta table fields will be the uh, columns or, or fields that are associated with those things that I've selected in the perspective oops I mean click that okay so um, kind of the best practices that I'll, I'll leave you with here are build user defined hierarchies you definitely want to do that um, the reason for that is, is it gives your users a a very intuitive way to navigate through their data and to view their data uh, and it is definitely a good thing for your users um, use partitioning to separate volatile data from stale data so if you have 
uh, data that is not changing anymore, put that in, put that in its own partition so that way you don't have to process it every day anymore. Um, put data that is volatile or changing in its own partition so that way you only have to process the partition that has changing data. That's going to give you better processing performance and make um, cut down on your processing time because you're not having to process all the data. You're only processing your changing data. Um, so. Um, and use perspectives when it makes sense to um, make it easier for your users to um, navigate your cube. And it uh, looks like we're out of time, so that's all that I'll leave you with here. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the session. I will hang around to answer any questions. Um, I'll post the link to the PowerPoint up on my blog, so check that out if you are interested. My blog is SQL Dusty. Let's see. Oops, too big sqldusty.wordpress.com. That's where you'll be able to find the link to the PowerPoint slide deck. Then, of course, if you guys have more, further questions than what we get a time to cover here, um, you can always go to my blog and post those in the comments, and I'll answer those there. Um, if you want to send me a message on Twitter with a specific question, you can always do that at sqldusty.com. Feel free to do that as well. So thank you for everybody for attending this session. I hope you guys found it useful. And uh, look forward to seeing you in another training on the Tease event. I've got a, uh, I've actually got a webinar coming up here in a couple weeks on um, navigating hierarchies in, uh, with MDX. So if you've got some questions about uh, MDX, uh, come check out that session. That one is not, uh, not next week, but the week after. So two weeks from today is when I'll be delivering that session. So thank you, everybody. Dustin, do you want me to read off some questions? Should, uh, I guess I should unmute myself. I said only if they're good questions. <laughs> okay. So. Um, in SQL Server, is the tabular model available in Standard Edition? Um, you know, that's a good question. You know, I, I only that, – that would be something I have to look up. I believe it is. I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, you know, working with our clients, 99% of our clients have Enterprise Edition, so I haven't done a lot of work in the, in the Standard Edition. Um, but I believe that it is supported um, in the Standard Edition. But I would, have to, I would have to verify that before I could say with 100% confidence that it is. Okay. Um, about Let's migration, see. can you have multidimensional as a source for tabular? Yes. Yes, you can. Okay. All right. How does the partition help? Does it place the data onto different data files? Um, no. Basically, what partitioning is going to do for you is going to – the only thing that partitioning in Tabular is going to do for you is, is to allow you to um, specify which partitions you want to process. It's, it's purely just an administrative type thing. So it's not going to help you with, um, 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 you know, pro processing performance. It, you may be able to save time on processing because you're only processing partitions that you need to. Um, but um, you, um, your processing is only going to, your partitioning is only going to help you with um, processing the data that you need to. Um, now, as far as different data files, remember this is all going to be stored in memory, so you don't have the, the data files like you normally have with uh, multidimensional. Um, so there, there's a difference there. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that you don't need um, disk space because you do need to be able to store the tabular model on disk for when you do things like restarting a service, restarting the service. Um, but it, it's not particularly going to help you with, um, you know, um, processing times and query times like, pro like partitioning a multidimensional cube does. Um, can products like Tableau access tabular models, or do the users need to use Excel? Nope. Uh, Tableau, um, the, I actually just rolled off an uh, engagement with a client that was using uh, Tableau, and we ended up, the cli our client is actually on SQL Server 2014, and so we actually um, ended up going with um, uh, SQL Server 2014 tables with clustered column store indexes and uh, fed the Tableau data model off that because of the performance is very good at, um, uh, but the performance also um, was really good with a tabular model connection too. So tabular can connect straight up, or tableau, excuse me, can connect straight up to a tabular model, multidimensional cube, or um, 
or, uh, or SQL Server tables, of course. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that the calculations that you build in Tableau, if you're using a tabular model, that your calculations are going to be in MDX. So something to keep in mind there is if your users are, like to write their own calculations in Tableau, um, they are going to need to learn a little bit of MDX to do that against a tabular model. Last question. Um, how do end users access cubes without Visual Studio? Um, so if they're going to want to query the cube, they can connect up with Excel like we did um, during the demonstration. So if they've got Excel, they can connect to the cube by going up to data. Um, from other sources, from analysis services, they ex just type in wherever their uh, server happens to be. So something like that. Then they can see the tabular models that are out on the server, and they select which one they want. Click Next, Finish. Then you got a new pivot table, and so then they can interact with it. Um, they can also interact with it, like uh, the previous question mentioned, Tableau. If you've got Tableau, you can connect up to it in that way. Um, if there are SSRS reports that your team has developed, they can interact with it that way. So um, a lot of different reporting technologies that connect up to a tabular model. Okay, so, great, great. Good question. All right, thanks for attending the webinar, everyone. All right, thank you, everybody.